Welcome to episode number two from the series on population genetics. And in this episode, we're going to deal with how do genes become a phenotype and how do this uh, variation in phenotypes and genotypes affect evolution. But I want to begin with what is going to be our new definition of evolution. And we're going to use this definition from here on out because it's really a much more detailed one than what we had from the previous series of screencasts on Darwin's um, theory. Previously, when we were dealing with Darwin's theory, we simply said that evolution is defined as a change in species over time. Well, in the previous episode from this series, we talked about allele frequency. So what we're going to do is we're going to incorporate allele frequency into our definition of evolution. So from here on out, evolution will be defined as any change in the relative frequencies of alleles in a population over time. So it's a change in the allele frequencies from generation to generation to generation. Okay, we have a population of beetles here. We have two alleles. We have a green allele and we have a yellow allele. And notice the heterozygous individuals, they're brown. All right. So in the first generation, 75% of the gene pool was the green allele, 25% was the yellow allele. Now, there must have been some form of selection pressure where the yellow allele is going to increase fitness because in the second generation, the yellow allele becomes more common. It's now 29% of the gene pool. Therefore, we should see less of the green, so now it's 71%. So this beetle population is evolving because we have a change in allele frequencies over time. In other words, from generation to generation to generation. All right. Now, what are the sources of this genetic variation? And this is going to be kind of a review on this slide, all right, because we've, we've gone over this before, specifically in our Chapter 12 uh, series of screencasts, all right? The first form is mutation, and mutation is defined as any change in base sequence. Now, um, mutations in the germ line, and when we say germ, Basically, what we're talking about is gametes. So germ and gametes essentially mean the same thing in this discussion. If the mutation is contained inside an egg or a sperm cell, that mutation will show up in every cell within the new organism. If the mutation occurs within just one cell in the organism after it's born, then it's only going to be found in any of the cells that were produced after my mitosis. So mutations that are contained inside eggs and sperms will affect the entire organism more. Okay, genetic recombination. Genetic recombination simply means gene shuffling. In other words, you're getting a new combinations of genes. And when you do sexual reproduction, it's really easy to get a vast array of different gene combinations in each individual. Because meiosis creates things called independent assortment. Remember, indep independent assortment is defined as the alleles will segregate independently of each other. Um, for you guys, you probably remember foiling when we were doing genetics, okay? Crossing over, if you rec recall, occurs during meiosis number one specifically during prophase number one, and this is when parts of an allele, or I'm sorry, parts of a chromosome will switch places. Think of it as like cutting the deck in cards. And then the greatest part of genetic combination is half of your genes come from dad and the other half come from mom. So you are not a clone of either of your parents, but you're a mixture of their genes, okay? And these three things together create the vast variety of phenotypes that you're going to find in any population, uh, even in humans and dogs and whatever, right? Because anything that produces through sexual reproduction, they're going to use these three to get the great variety of genetic combinations, okay? Now, in some simpler organisms like uh, bacteria, you can get what is called lateral gene transfer. And what lateral gene transfer means is that we have one individual over here, and he pretty much hands off their genes to the person next to them. So like if you're sitting at your desk and there's another student sitting next to you, you would just grab some of your genes and go, here, have them. I don't need them. You keep them. Oh, you're going to give me some too? That's very nice. Thank you very much. You now have a new combination of genes. Now this occurs in bacteria. Bacteria use three forms of lateral gene transfer. Transformation, which we learned about in chapter 12 with Henry Griffith and the mice and pneumonia, and that's called transformation. 
Uh, another one that you'll learn about as you go up in your biology classes would be transduction. This is when a bacterial phage, remember those are the viruses that affect bacteria, is delivering new genes to the organism. And then another one called conjugation, which is as close to sexual reproduction as bacteria can get. All right. If you take AP Biology or any of the Project Lead the Way Biology classes, you'll, you'll learn more about those. All right. What is the relationship between genotype and phenotype? Now, this should be a complete review, and you should say, duh, I already know this, okay? The genotype determines the phenotype. In other words, your genes determine what you look like. So, for example, all these chromosomes are the genes that determine the phenotype of this mouse, okay? Once again, this should be a review. Nothing should be a surprise here, all right? Now, what is a single gene trait? A single gene trait is a trait that's determined by a single gene that has two alleles. Think of a dominant allele and a recessive allele, or a blue allele and a white allele. There's just two alleles for that one trait. Now, there can only be two or three different phenotypes. Now, if there's only two phenotypes, you have complete dominance, okay? So that's what we see up here in this picture. We have a purple allele, we'll say that it's A. We have a white allele, which is a little A. And so we'll say this individual is homozygous dominant, this individual is homozygous recessive, all their babies will be heterozygous. In this case, the purple is dominant over white, so all of the heterozygous individuals will show the dominant phenotype. Basic genetics straight out of our genetics set of screencasts, all right? There's three different phenotypes in incomplete or co-dominance, okay? So what we have down here is we have a red flower whose homozygous big R, and then we have a white flower whose homozygous Ws, and then all the babies in here are RW, and those are pink. So... This would be incomplete dominance, and we have three phenotypes, one, two, and three, okay? Now, if this was incomplete, I'm sorry, codominance, some of these petals would be red, some of them would be white, red, white, and that would still be your third phenotype. So you'd either be all red, all white, or red and white if it was codominance. Okay, polygenic traits. These are traits that are controlled by two or more different gene pairs, okay? So, uh, for example, let's go with this color. You would have to have some A's, some B's, some D's, and some E's. You have to have all four of these gene pairs working together to show the phenotype. Now, when you have this situation, you have many possible phenotypes. And what it creates is a bell-shaped curve, which is your normal distribution, okay? Now, human height and skin colors are two examples of a polygenic trait. In fact, a ton of human traits are actually polygenic, okay? So let's get rid of that, and let's show you this picture. Okay, um, if you don't know me very well, I love to play golf, and so I found that this normal distribution of golf is pretty funny to me. All right, now, so we've got all these golfers over the world, all right? Some of them are just so terrible, they can barely swing the club. Like, they're just going to swing at the golf ball, and they're going to kick it like two feet. They're awful. They should probably never play the game again, all right? And then there's some who are so ridiculously good that they get paid to play. So you're thinking like Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson, Roy McIlroy. Uh, there's just not very many of those guys. Now, most golfers are just going to be average they're going to shoot around 100, okay? The average golfer is about a 16 or 17 handicap, which means they just barely shoot under 100, all right? I have a golf handicap of six. I probably fit somewhere around there, okay? All right, that's going to end this episode. Uh, pretty short and sweet, really a lot of review. I do want you to remember that brand new uh, evolution definition. It's a change in allele frequencies over time. Okay, until the next episode, we're going to catch you on that flip side.